Do we have any Winnie the Pooh fans out there? Anybody a Winnie the Pooh fan? All right, great. Lots of people. Awesome. My wife is a huge Winnie the Pooh fan. We decorated our kids' rooms when they were babies in Winnie the Pooh theme. And uh, so, hi, honey. She's not feeling well. You got to pray for her. She's got this cold or something going on. So anyway, she's sitting out back not to infect anybody. Um, anyway, in one of the Winnie the Pooh episodes, Pooh and Piglet are walking in the quiet of the night through the woods, and uh, they're out for this evening stroll, and it's real silent, and Pooh, or uh, Piglet breaks the silence, and he asks this question, when you wake up in the morning, Pooh, what's the first thing you, th- you say to yourself? And Pooh resp- responds, what's for breakfast? What do you say, Piglet? And Piglet says, I say, I wonder what exciting thing is going to happen today. Which one do you identify with? You know, I think uh, many of us may identify with Pooh, whose first thoughts in the day turn to his tummy, rather than with Piglet, who thinks, man, what, what exciting thing is going to happen today? And what are the possibilities ahead of us? I fear too often we're much like Pooh. We're, we're like bears with tiny brains, you know, and uh, we concern ourselves with our own wants and our own desires and our own what we think we need. And, and we wake up in the morning and our first thoughts, they turn to, oh, man, I got so much to, to get done today. I got to do this and that and this and that. And, or we think about our own wants and desires and we think about how can I get what I want today. Uh, we think about what's for breakfast rather than the possibilities that may lay ahead. God did not put our church here to fail. And I would just wonder what would happen if we thought more like Piglet? What would happen if we thought, I can't wait to see what exciting things are going to happen today? What would happen if we forgot about what I want and what I think I need? What if I forgot about fulfilling my own desires and just focused on the great things that God could do through me rather than just give me everything I want and need. What would that look like? I believe the best days of the church are ahead of us. There are great things right around the corner in store for First Church of Christ here in Barberton, Ohio. And I'm excited to see what's going to happen here. I'm like Piglet. I can't wait. I wonder what exciting thing is going to happen here at First Church. I can't wait to see that. Great things are around the corner. But we've got to get back to church. We got to get back to church. We do need to improve our attendance. We do need to make church more of a priority. We do need to go to worship more often. We need to go to church more often. But more than that, the challenge has been throughout the series is we need to get back to the church that God intended us to be. In the first week of the series, we talked about how our church needs to be on mission. Remember this, how, how, uh, making, how we need to be on mission to make disciples of Jesus who make disciples of Jesus. We talked about how uh, uh, First Church is a church where everyone is welcomed, everyone is needed, and where everyone is transformed in the power of Jesus Christ. That was the first week. The next week, we talked about how our church needs to be together one-minded, like uh, on, a, on a common goal, and how we need to focus in on our up relationship with God and our in relationships with each other and our out relationships uh, with the community, those who don't go to church, uh, and, and our friends and people in, in our city. Remember the triangle, and we kind of went through that and talked about that. And throughout the series, I've been kind of saying this this kind of same message. We've been talking about how we want God, uh, we want to see God using great people to do great things here at First Church. And I believe that God is truly making us into a great church. He is using a lot of you to do some wonderful, exciting things. But here's a question. How do you define a great church? What makes up a great church? Any answers out there? How do we know you're great? Uh, the church I came from, my, my, our church administrator used to say it this way. We could measure it by human standards. We could measure it by bucks and butts. How many bucks can we bring in and how many butts are sitting in the pews? We could measure it by human standards, and, we can, and, and certainly we should. We should see how much money is coming in and how many people are sitting in the pews. We could measure a great church uh, by 
uh, the plethora of programs we've got going on. We could say that a church is great by how big our building is. We can use these human standards, but if we're going to get back to church, then the measurements of a great church go deeper than just these human standards. And we should still use these human standards. Don't get me wrong here. Uh, but there are some deeper standards, I think, that God gives us, uh, and especially in Ephesians chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. You can use the Bibles in the pews. I'll be uh, uh, talking out of the New International Version. So, uh, But Ephesians chapter 4 gives us what a great church looks like. God uses the Apostle Paul to write this letter, and he kind of lays it out for, for everyone. This is what a great church looks like. And so in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, I'm praying that First Church becomes a great church like this, a church filled with great people doing great things. Here's what Paul has to say. He says, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. Let me ask a question. Which one are you? How many of you would say you're an apostle? No hands. How many of you would say that you're a prophet? No hands. How many of you would say that you're, a, what's the next one? I don't know, uh, an evangelist. You share the good news with people. Okay, we got a few on that one. Excellent. How many of you would say you're a pastor? Like a shepherd. Everybody's pointing at me. <laughs> How many of you would say that you're a teacher? You used to be a teacher. Okay, good. How many of you are thinking, um, I have no idea what any of these mean, so I have no idea which one I am. Anybody? Or how many of you are saying, you know what? Um, do I have to be one of these five things? Anybody asking that question? Do I have to be one of these five things? The answer to that question is no. You don't have to be one of these five things. We tend to lean toward one of these gifts, uh, but you don't have to be any of these five things. Now, I want to give you a tool in case you're, you're curious to know which way you may lean. Uh, which of these you might be. Our elders and I took this survey a couple weeks ago, and it was, it, it was interesting, the results that came back and, and, and which area each of our elders and I lean toward. And, and the surveys, it's, it's an online survey, go to the website, 80 questions, takes about, I don't know, almost 10 minutes, I would think. And each of us discovered which uh, of these gifts we lean toward. I scored the highest in Apostle and Prophet lowest in being a pastor. Imagine that. Um, so I want to encourage you, go online and take this survey. The, the interesting part of, about taking the survey is it will tell you which area you, you scored the highest in, and then you can read about each area. What's it mean for the church? What implications does it have uh, to you as, as a leader maybe in, in Christ's church? But uh, the link is in your uh, bulletin. It's called fivefoldsurvey.com. Go to that website. It's absolutely free. 80 questions. Whenever you got some time, if you're curious, go to that website and find out which one you lean toward. Now, I don't want to get into the definition of each of these gifts because I think uh, Paul gives us something more I want to focus on in the very next verse. So Paul writes this. He gave some to be prophets, some to be apostles, evangelists, pastors, teachers, in order, verse 12, to prepare God's people for works of service. To prepare God's people for works of service. Now, I could spend a whole message probably a whole message series just on this one verse. There's a lot packed in there, but I want to pull out a couple phrases. And one of the phrases I want to pull out is God's people. Let me ask this. Who are God's people? Oh, that's easy, right? We are. We're God's people. Now, hold up. Let's back up for a second. Because the, the, the word that Paul uses here, remember the New Testament has, was written originally in the Greek language, and the word that Paul uses here for God's people is hagios. Anybody know what hagios means? Holy or saint. Whoa, wait a minute, Jeremy, I'm no saint. Man, if you knew the things I did last week, I did some pretty unsaintly things, right? Some of you be thinking, I, when I walked into the church this morning, I'm just, I'm just glad the church didn't fall in. I'm, I'm definitely not a saint. You don't know my husband. He's, he's no saint either. You should have seen the stuff he was doing. You know, but if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and if you have confessed Jesus as your Lord, and if you've been baptized, you've received the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, that Spirit lives inside of you now. If you're one of those people, you are no longer called sinner. 
You're called saint. You're a saint. Not just reserved for the Catholic people, my friends. <laughs> You're a saint. You don't have to do miracles or anything like that to be a saint. You've been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You've given your life to him. He is your Lord. You receive the Holy Spirit through baptism. You're a saint in Jesus Christ. And that's who you are. You're no longer called sinner, but saint. Saint simply means holy. God has made you holy. You are one of God's holy people. Let me give you a challenge. Look at your neighbor, husbands and wives. Call him or her Saint so-and-so. Go ahead, do it. Some of you are struggling with it. Man, I don't know. You are. You're a saint in Jesus Christ. That's an excellent phrase. Now, the other phrase I want to look at is this works of service. Works of service. Now, some of you may be floored when you find out what Paul is saying here. Some of you may already know what Paul is saying here, and I, I admire that. The phrase works of service comes from this Greek word diakonia. Diakonia, and that means ministry. Diakonia means ministry. This is the same word from which we get the title. What's it sound like? Deacon. Yeah, deacon. Okay, so here's, here's, here's what I would say. If I could transliterate this verse, I would say that Paul is writing to prepare God's people, his saints, for deaconing. Now, make sure you don't get me wrong here. We are preparing all of God's people for works of ministry, to be ministers in his kingdom. Wait a minute. Oh, Jeremy, you know what? No, that's not right. Ministers are supposed to be men. Ministers are supposed to be married and have children, right? Ministers are supposed to have a Bible college degree. Uh, ministers are, are, are supposed to uh, preach. You know, they're supposed to call on the sick and, and uh, they're supposed to uh, lead churches. I'm no minister, Jeremy. What are you talking about? No, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're man or woman. It doesn't matter if you're married or not. It doesn't matter if you have a Bible college degree or not. It doesn't matter if, if you lead a church. It doesn't matter if you can preach or not. If you are a saint, then we are all to be preparing for some type of work of ministry. We are all ministers. Now, we put ministers up on this pedestal because we think they're the leader. We're not talking about leading. We're talking about serving. This word diakonia means service. What is my area of service in the church? That, that's what all of God's people, all of his saints should be asking. How can I contribute to the church to be in service to it? We're all servants of Jesus Christ. We're all diakonias. Isn't that neat? We're all doing works of service. That's what we're supposed to be doing. So here's, here's the first point, if you want to write this in your bulletins, a great church is made up of great people doing great things. Great church is made up of great people doing great things. A church, a church that is built around a renowned or famous preacher, a church that depends on the ministry staff to do all the work of ministries in a church, that's not a great church. A great church involves its entire people, all the people, including those sitting in the pews. It involves everyone. Each one of you is made great through the blood of Jesus Christ. You are made great through the blood of Jesus Christ, and God wants, you to, wants to use you to do great things. And then Paul says that build up the body of Christ of Jesus Christ, that the body of Christ may be built up. Now, one of the reasons I think we come to church, many of us, is that we may be built up. You know, we come in these doors and we hope to find some kind of edification here, some kind of encouragement, so that when we walk out of these doors, we go, man, I'm glad I was in church today. And we come in these doors expecting that, uh, because by the time Monday morning comes, it's all over. Like, I need to get back to church because, whoo. And life gets tough, right? We go through life. We, we go throughout the week. We're checking off our to-do lists. You know, we're, we're putting up with the crazy people at work. We're dealing with the aches and pains of, of daily life. Some of us have troubles in our families. Some of us are struggling in our marriages. Some of us 
Kids, you have tests at school that you're studying for and that consumes you. Uh, it, some, of, some of you have cancer. Some of you are dealing with family members who have cancer and you got other health issues. Life beats us down, doesn't it? You just feel beat down all the time. So church, Sunday mornings, is maybe the only place that you can find solace and peace. You come here so that you can be built up again. Maybe a song touches you. Maybe, maybe something in the message uh, strikes a chord with you. You go, man, I'm glad I heard that today. Maybe you find edification by somebody in the lobby you're shaking hands with. They say an encouraging word. But there's something about church that just lifts you up, only it may not happen every Sunday. You know, maybe, maybe uh, you, you come in and somebody rubs you the wrong way or they say the wrong thing to you and you go, oh, man. I'm kind of I'm wishing I didn't go to church today, you know? Uh, church is supposed to be a place where we find edification. Christians are supposed to be people that we can go to and, and build each other up and be there for us through the good and bad times. But sometimes people make it all about them, right? You know, and, and, and it just hits us the wrong way. Now, I talked last week about changing church verbiage. Those of you who are here, you remember this, hopefully. Instead of calling each other members of the church, what was the word I used? Partners. I love that. It meant, many of you encouraged me after the worship service. I was out in the lobby or come and shake my hand. And, and it was so cool because some of you said, hey, partner, and shook my hand. I was like, yeah, you got it today. That was awesome. We're partners together. Members, members typically ask, what's in it for me? What, what can I get out of this? What can the organization do for me? Where partners tend to ask, what can I give to you? How can I help? What can I give to the organization? So I think I'd rather view the church as, as a bunch of partners together working for a common cause. Um, and so what I'm getting at is here is, is that the church isn't about you. The church isn't about me. It's not about what our leadership wants. It's not about any of the leaders in the church. It's not about any one person in the church. But when it does become about one person other than Jesus Christ, that's when we start getting discouraged. That's when we start getting down and, and maybe rubbing people the wrong way. Uh, the church isn't about any of these. Look at Paul's words in the opening verses of, of the first chapter of Ephesians. Here's what he writes. See if you catch this. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Look at that, five times in just three verses, Paul points to Jesus. He could have made it all about himself. Paul was very good at what he did. He could have said, man, I'm Paul and I've got this going on in my life. No, he pointed to Jesus. A great church doesn't focus on what we can get out of church or what's in this for me when I show up on Sunday morning. No, a great church focuses on Jesus. Great church focuses on Jesus. You want meaning in life? You want to figure out what we're living here for? You want a purpose for which you can live? Maybe you've been asking, man, you know, I don't, I don't know why I was even put on this earth. Why was I put here? I love how the message paraphrase translates Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. It says, it's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. How many people out there got their priorities mixed up? Because they're trying to find meaning and definition in, in their work and in, in their hobbies and everything else that's going on in the world. And Paul gives us the answer right here in Ephesians chapter 1. It's in Christ that we find meaning and purpose in life. So great churches don't build their own little kingdoms. Great churches don't look at their programs and ministries and say, that's ours. 
Programs and ministries don't belong to you or to me. Everything we set out to do, our leadership and everybody in the church, everything we set out to do is all about Jesus. From the songs that we sing, to the sermons we preach, to the classes we offer, to the, to the, to the uh, functions we plan here at church, our intention is that we can be focused on Jesus Christ. We're striving to be a great church centered around building each other up as the body of Jesus Christ. Apart from him, we're what? We're nothing. Apart from Jesus Christ, what we do in this room and what we do as a church congregation, it's just one big party. Between you and me, I don't know that I want to be a part of that kind of party. But when it's about Jesus, that's the party I want to be a part of. So verse 13, we're building each other up as a body of Christ. Verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Here's, here's this next part. A great church is united in Christ. We're one. A great church will stay focused on Christ and then become united in Christ, melding into him as one body in him. We're in this together. We talked about this last week. We're in this together. Real maturity in Christ is not shown by how great your faith is. Real maturity in faith is not shown by how much Bible you know. Real maturity is not shown by... by whether or not you speak in tongues or perform miracles or do any of these other things, that's not maturity in Christ. Real maturity in Christ is shown in our unity, in our togetherness. I don't want to spend much more time on that because we talked about it last week. So if you missed last Sunday, I encourage you to go online and watch last week's message on what it means to be together and what that looks like in finding unity. Let's go on. Verse 14. Paul writes, we'll no longer be infants, no longer be baby Christians, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. This next point is very important to us, our leadership and me, and, and, uh, and, and it's, it's very, very important. And that is a great church is doctrinally sound. Doctrine matters. What we believe matters. A great church does not preach on uh, or teach on its own opinions. A great church doesn't seek to be politically correct. A great church doesn't compromise its own beliefs based on what the world may be saying out there by the world standards. We don't, we don't compromise on that. A great church preaches and teaches God's word alone. One of my professors in college uh, told us, uh, I was in a homiletics class, preaching class, and he, and he told us, uh, you want to know the key to preaching great messages? Here it is. I mean, this is the most important thing you'll ever know, he said. You want to preach great messages throughout the rest of your life? Here's the key. Preach the Word of God. That's it. And I try to stay there because that's where it's at. The Word of God is where it's at. Paul says to Timothy in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. They don't want to hear it. The time is coming. Instead, to suit their own desires, they're going to gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. We don't have to look very far to see that's happening today, do we? You know, we, the church says something, the world says, Nope, don't want to hear that, and they turn and walk away. It's happening right now. So here's what we're going to do in a couple weeks. We're going to go right after it. We're, we're going to start a new series called Believe. And we're going to talk about what our church believes based on the Bible. We're going to talk about what we believe. Some of you may not even know. You've been coming here for a little while and you go, man, what does this church believe? You can go online and look at our statement of faith and all that good stuff. But what does this church really believe? So we're going to get into this, uh, this series. I hope you don't miss it. Be here every Sunday for that. It's going to be a, a, an excellent series. And, and also during that series, we're going to start a study for adults on Wednesday nights. And, and I think, man, it's going to be really good because here's what's going to happen. We're calling it Wednesday Night Celebration. 
And we're going to get together, and the adults are going to, going to gather together for a time of discussion, time of uh, getting to know each other, but also a time of going deeper in what we heard Sunday morning. So you hear the message on Sunday morning, then we come and talk about it on Wednesday night, uh, and we go deeper and find out more about that. Because I can't stand up here for two hours and say everything I want to say. It just can't happen. I, I'm giving you all the surface level stuff. So come to that. Each of you got one of these in your bulletin, hopefully. Wednesday night celebration. On the back is a registration form. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to gather at 6 o'clock on Wednesday nights. We're going to have a meal. And uh, we'll do that for about a half hour. It'll be a nice time to sit down, eat together, get to know each other. And then uh, the kids will come in here, the elementary age kids on down for their um, uh, Magic City Kids Club. They, they do songs and, and a lesson time is really cool. And then uh, at 6.30, they'll come here at 6, and, the, and the adults will find a classroom depending on how many people we have. And we'll sit down, we'll discuss uh, each week one of the beliefs uh, that First Church agrees with. If you are interested in doing this or if you want to do this, fill out the registration form on the back and uh, indicate whether you've got kids that are going to come to Magic City's Kids Club or, and indicate uh, if you're going to attend the Bible study. Fill that out and then drop it off. You, uh, you could do three things. You can drop it in the offering tray later on. You could uh, drop it at the information center if you forget or just hand it to me on your way out today. This is going to be good stuff because we're going to go down a path of being doctrinally sound. Grounded in the Word of God. That's where it's at. Um, let me give you the next point, and that is a, a great church is loving. A great church is loving. Paul writes in verse 15, he says, Instead, speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. Everything in the New Testament is built around this word love. And if we do that, we'll grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head. That is Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, known as the great love chapter. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. You know, we love that. Why? Because, because Paul's writing and he says, man, love should be the, the motive for everything that you do. Love should be behind every action you take in life. And love, love is, is superior to everything else. The last verse in the 1 Corinthians 13 says, says, these three remain, faith, hope, and, and the greatest of these is, isn't that all? I mean, love is, is the foundation to everything we do as a church and, and in Jesus Christ. It should be the motive for everything. Loving churches make the love of God known to each other here inside and to the city, to the people in the city, because God is love. God is love. If we love each other, if we love people in our city, then, then God will be displayed to everyone around us. First Peter uh, chapter 4, verses 7 and 8 says, The end of all things is near. How many of you believe the end is coming? I mean, my goodness, it's, it's scary. The end of all things is near, Peter writes. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. In verse 8, above all, love each other deeply. Do we love each other deeply? Do we really care about each other here inside this building? And then he writes, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. If we truly love each other, then, then reconciliation will happen. Forgiveness will happen. And God will build a great church here because of love. We come full circle now, and, and let me give you the last point. And that is a great church involves everyone. It's, we've come full circle. It involves everyone. A great church is made up of great people doing great things for the kingdom of God. Verse 16 says, from him, that is Jesus, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. This is, not, this is a beautiful picture of, of the church, of a great church. Each person, Paul says, is important. Everybody's supporting each other. Everybody has a function. Everybody has a job to do. Every single one of you is needed. Each one of you has something to contribute to make First Church a great church. And you might think if you miss a Sunday that you're not missed here at First Church of Christ. You might think that you might not even receive a phone call from me or anybody else. You might not receive one of those, hey, we missed you cards in the mail. And you might think, well, nobody really missed. That's, that's not true. 
If there is a part missing from the body of Jesus Christ, if you were missing your hand, would you know it? When Jesus is missing something from his body, the church, he knows it, and you are missed. Don't go missing. Don't go missing. You matter to God. You matter to God. And you have an important role to play here at First Church. A great church has no spectators. A great church doesn't have fans sitting in the bleachers cheering everyone else on. A great church is filled with great people doing great things for the kingdom of God. And each one of you is the key to making First Church a great church. You are the key. Now, here's, here's what's going on. I got about 20 people signed up to help us today with these door hangers. 20 people. That's pretty good. It shouldn't take us very long. I could use about 10 more. So here's, here's what's going to happen. After the worship service is over, we've got pizza coming in. My wife's going to pick it up. Yep, I think she left now. We've got pizza coming in and some pop. And we're going to have a couple slices of pizza. We're going to go in the FLC. And uh, I, they're all ready to go. I've got maps and everything. And, and it's not going to take very long, trust me. It might, it might take a half hour. And uh, we're going to hang these on, on the doors of our neighborhood right around this church. 425 homes. So if you're willing to stay and help out with that, I'd love for you to well, uh, join us. It won't take very long. It'll give us a little, few more people just to hang out with and go out and do this thing and be done for the day. You'll get home in time for the Browns game. Okay, we don't, That's important. I don't want anybody to miss the Browns game. That's, that's real important. Except for maybe Bonnie. She's that Steelers fan. Eh? <laughs> So come out and help us with that. Now, I believe, like I said, the best days are ahead of us. The best days of this church are coming. It's right around the corner. I'm excited to see what God is doing, is going to do here in Barberton, Ohio, through First Church of Christ. But we got to get back to church. We got to get back to the church that God intended us to be. We need to be a church where everyone is welcome, where everyone is needed and where everyone is coming in these doors and being transformed for Jesus Christ. Where when you come in here on Sunday morning as you are, you leave a little bit better. That's the type of church I want us to be. We want to be a church where everyone is, is uh, together, on mission, focused on that, and everything else dissipates. Can we do that? Can we forget about what's in this for me? Can we forget about our wants and our desires, our preferences? Can we forget about what's for breakfast? And just wonder to ourselves, what exciting thing is going to happen? Can we anticipate the great things that God is going to do through us? Can we do that? 